Mary Gelsler, and uh, thank you welcome to the schoolhouse. Uh, if you haven't been here before, isn't it great? Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. Uh, which leads me right into, we have, an, uh, we put out a beautiful annual newsletter. And so if you don't have one, I think we have some copies in the back. And And we accept donations. Um, we welcome them because, as you know, we're a nonprofit, and we do these wonderful things. And it just takes money to keep this place alive. So anything you can contribute, we appreciate it. I think we have a glass jar up there, and um, we have some wonderful ladies here who made some goodies for you to help yourself at the end of the night. And uh, we have a bathroom. It's outside. It's an outhouse. <laughs> um, and with us, I think that's the idea. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker here tonight. Um, she's uh, quite a mystery. You know, so that word will mean something. Yeah, that means something. And um, you must have all like gruesome stuff because you came out to hear the word already. So, so. Great. So with no ado, uh, let me welcome Sharon Saber. I'd like to thank all of you for coming here tonight because um, my name is Jolly Jane Toppin. Uh, I'm called Jolly because I'm so charming and fun. We just love to have many of your parties. And once in a while, I do things that you wouldn't expect. Actually. Uh, the uh, problem I have is this: that I murdered a lot of people, and I did it very cleverly. I was very scientific about what I did, and I resent the fact that that young woman over the Fall River, that Lizzie, whatever her name is. <laughs> is much more famous than I am. And I think that's totally unfair, and I want to let all of you know what I did. I am very famous in this area because I killed four members of the Davis family who were Katanga residents all in one summer, and which was a really big mistake in my, on my part because I really believe that if I had not killed all those people all at once, I wouldn't have attracted such attention to myself, and I could have gotten away with doing murder after murder for a long time. So, this is, the, I just want you to know the story of my life, what I did. It has been discussed. Why did I do this? What was my motivation? Was I really insane? Because after all, they judged me insane at my trial, and I did go to time to the insane asylum for the rest of my life. But was I really insane, or did I have a profit motive sometimes? So I'll tell you all those things, and see, you can decide what you think. I was born in 1857. My name was Nora Kelly. I had a pair, my parents were Peter Kelly and Bridget Kelly. And uh, Bridget, my mother, died when I was very young. So I was so young that I don't remember her at all. My father, I wish I didn't remember him because he was so bad. He was a drunk, he was abusive. And he eventually took, brought me and my sister, who was a little bit older, Delia, to the Boston Female Asylum for Destitute Girls, which was a big improvement over where I'd been living before, I'll tell you. My father was actually uh, Judge Insane. And the way that they, people, they knew he was insane was that he was a tailor and he sewed his eyelids, own eyelids. 
shut. That would be a good clue. <laughs> so, <laughs> fortunately, after I went to the, uh, the orphanage, I didn't have to see him anymore. Now, what they did with these girls who were in the orphanage, they would uh, let them go home and live with other, you know, households. A family would decide that they wanted a girl, and uh, they could sign them out and sign big legal papers in an apprenticeship-style agreement. And the girl would go home with that family and be taught how to do household chores, cooking, cleaning, and so on. And in some cases, I think it was almost like slave labor. In my case, it wasn't. I really, uh, the people that took me home with them, the Thomas, they were very good people. The only problem was that uh, Mrs. Thomas kept reminding me that I was kind of from an inferior race of people, you know, the Irish. <laughs> so I was, and that was about the only problem I had. And with the Thomas, they gave me good education, and I actually lived with that family until I was 28 years old. They had a, a, a daughter who was about 10 years older than me, and uh, I was friendly with her at that time. So I, uh, when I finally reached the age of 28, I really had to do something. Now, young women today have a really easy time because they can go into any profession they want. For me, and I was uh, I could have become not married and become somebody's wife, or I could have uh, become a housekeeper, domestic servant of some kind, or I could become a nurse, and that's about all the choices that I had. So I decided to become a nurse, which was very fortunate for me, especially uh, considering my proclivities. <laughs> able to learn all about the poisons and medications and how much to give somebody just to make them sick, how much to give them to actually kill them. So that was a, uh, the nurse's training was really excellent for me. And I found out as I went through this nurse's training, I was working in hospitals and people did watch every move I made. I found steal things from some of the patients. Little bits of money or small valuables. And I also was able to really experiment with morphine and atropine. I found that with morphine that would really put somebody to sleep, sometimes permanently. Uh, and with atropine it would uh, change the of the eye. The morphine dilated the eye and the atrophy closed the eye back up so that there wasn't the evidence there that something had gone awry. Well, so I learned, did all these things during nurses training and I was at Cambridge, I was at the hospital there, and they, um, my supervisor, I don't think he was suspicious of me, but he thought I was careless with the medications that I gave. So I was dismissed from the Cambridge Hospital. I didn't mind that at all because I then was loose. I was able to make my own uh, contracts with people, and the doctors liked me. They really, uh, they were very complimentary of me skills and they recommended me to private patients. So I found that private working uh, in somebody's home was much, number one, was much more lucrative than working in the hospital. And number two, it gave me opportunities that I didn't have in the hospital that I could disable probably. I did a lot of little thefts and I really don't know how I got away with it, but I did. 
So um, that was what I was doing. I was doing private nurse. Now, the first time I came to Katana was in 1896. And the Ferdinand family were renting a cottage from the Davis family. The Davis family had started the first really seaside hotel in this area. And uh, that building is half of it is still standing. It's on the Anset Road, fairly near the railroad bridge. The uh, so the Davis family were very prominent in the community and they owned the cottage. The cottage is now 19 history lane. It looks quite different from what it did at that time. It's, uh, later owners did some renovations and they made it clear. It's a little origin. There's a little square thing on top of a very flat roof. And uh, one of the owners ran out of the windows there. But sometime they took that off and peaked the roof, made it more like a normal house. And so the snow would run off or melt and run off in the winter. So, anyway, 19 Mystery Lane was the cottage and the Ferdinands were in it. So I was there with the Ferdinand family for a couple of three years. And then, because I was so nice to everybody in the community, everybody thought I was just wonderful. They asked my advice on medical issues. I was very happy to share my knowledge. I took children to the beach, and I uh, was just always very helpful. And the Davises thought a lot of me, so when I decided that I wanted to rent that cottage myself, they were very willing to give me a good price. So uh, they, they rented the cottage to me for $250 per summer. As you may notice, the prices have since gone up. So we you know, I'm not used to this. <laughs> we didn't have this back in my day. Uh, so, the Davises had rented to me. Now, I was doing private nursing. I was up in, I was, uh, up in Cambridge. And I was working with a family named the Beatle family. And uh, Mrs. Davis decided that she had waited long enough for the rent money that I owe, which was about $500, which is a lot of money for me. I really didn't have the $500. So she came to the Beagle House, but she fell on her way to the, uh, to the uh, uh, training. And Mrs. Davis, more than she was uh, elderly, in her 60s, you know. And she was, um, she fell down. And it was a very hot day. We were having a hot wave here. And it was, she was very uh, disconcerted. She fell down on the way to catch the train and she was hurrying. And people helped her to the, into the train, even though some people thought she shouldn't have known. But she did. She went on up she came to the where I was working. She had dinner with us and then said she was so tired and exhausted. He said, Oh my dear, you need a little honey on your water. So I uh, poured a little few additions into the water and uh, gave it to Mrs. Davis and she was soon ready for bed. So she went to bed. But she was ill, and the next day she was not there. She was just could not get out of bed. So I contacted her husband, and he came up. But he couldn't do anything about it. I was doing it. I no idea. I wanted to discharge my dad, and the best way to get rid of that debt was to get rid of Mrs. Davis. <laughs> so I, uh, over 
were several days I gave her a little bit of poetry here and there, and then I finally gave her one massive dose, and seven, in seven days she died. Well, the whole family, the Davis family, was very distraught about this. You can imagine. Uh, Mrs. Davis was uh, one of her grown daughters who was living in Chicago, had come to meet with her and perhaps do a little shopping. And uh, this daughter's name is Genevieve Ward. She was very, very, very upset when Mrs. Davis died. The other uh, daughter was uh, Mary Gibbs, called Minnie. She lived in the uh, castle over here. She was the wife of a sea captain. Well, I offered to go with Mrs. Davis to ride with the casket back to Katona, move in with the Davis family to help them. <laughs> this was uh, one of my charges, was to be of service to people. So I found that uh, Genevieve, which was the youngest one, was so distraught and so upset, and I felt so sorry for her that I thought she might be better off on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, Jim, have me, have some money, but so she did, and uh, she was pretty soon she, she was going to. Well, you can imagine a father who had just lost his wife, and now he had lost his youngest daughter, and he was very, very, very upset. Uh, not only that, but he had a lot of money in his wallet, and he had the contract that proved that I owed the rent for the summers. So, I decided that Mr. Davis needed to be the next person to go. <laughs> so one day, uh, when I had an opportunity, I just gave him a uh, good, solid dose of morphine, put him to bed, and the next morning, one of his grandchildren ran up to see what was wrong with Grandpa and found that he was not moving. So uh, Mr. Davis was not moving. Now, this leaves, this left only many who was the, uh, as I said, the wife of Irving Gibbs, who was the sea captain. Irving Gibbs' father's name was Paul. And Paul Gibbs started to get a little bit suspicious and became more suspicious after I murdered his daughter as well. She, uh, Harry Gordon was there, and he said to Mary, said, Mary, you really should talk to Jane about collecting that rent. Well, you know, I thought I'd heard enough about that rent. I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> and, and I didn't, I wouldn't have been able to pay it anyway. I didn't have the money. So I uh, I left many years as well. And she was uh, unfortunately, you know, these these girls, I should feel bad. I should feel guilty for leaving their children without their mothers, but I don't. I don't know. Something maybe is wrong. I'm not sure. So um, I want you to know that though, that the Davises were not my first victims. That uh, in addition to the people that I killed were in the hospital. I was a study nurse. I also killed um, one couple who were my landlords. And I did that because I didn't want to pay the rent. Seems like I was always getting out of the rent. And the other, um, another person that I killed was actually a good friend of mine. Her name was Myra Connors. And she was in charge of Vets Hall at the Marine Biological Lab in Wisconsin. And I wanted her job 
she was in a mess hall there, and she was also in charge at a theological seminary mess hall in Cambridge and her job. So I wanted her job. I just I got rid of her, and guess what? I got the job. <laughs> Which was probably unfortunate because I actually had some training for doing that, and I was a miserable failure at it, and I got fired. So that uh, Barbara really didn't didn't do what they And uh, the, other, the other person that I heard, in fact, I heard her at 19 Mr. Lane. Uh, she was my foster sister. She was Tom's daughter. I invited her down and uh, she was staying at my house. I she was, this was in uh, 1899 that this happened. She was uh, very happy. We went to the beach. We had a good time. And then she was, it was very warm though. And so when we got back, she was ready for bed. I gave her a good dose. She was, uh, she had left me $200 in her will, and I knew that. <laughs> but the bad thing about it was that I never did get the money. They never gave me the money. I don't, I'm not sure why that was, but um, that was, that's what happened. So she was, she was my The Davis family, they were a really good family. And they stuck close together. And uh, Captain Paul Gibbs, the father of law many Gibbs, was very, was very upset and he knew that something was going on. But I had murdered two young, healthy women. All of a sudden, it was just really too much. So he was, he insisted, he pulled some strings, contacted Leonard Wood from the Cassett, contacted the authorities, and had the authorities dig up the Davis's bodies. By this time, I had left the town, and I was about to stay with him. My foster sister's husband, and I had hopes then because I could use a husband, <laughs> but he uh, was not. He was not biting at the bait. I'm afraid. I'm really uh, quite upset. I had gone to his house. I had actually he had a sister who was staying there. He had a housekeeper who was staying there. I was afraid that they would stay and stand in my way. So I just murdered them. <laughs> then Mr. Brigham, uh, my uh, my target, uh, I decided that I would curry favor with him. So I gave him just a little bit of poison, just enough to make him sick. And that way I was able to be very attentive and very nice to him and nurse him back to health. And I was hoping that that would, uh, that would, what, clinch the deal for me? <laughs> but it didn't. He didn't bite. So I told him that, uh, that I was pregnant and I was going to accuse him of being the father of the baby. Well, that's bad. He said, okay, get out of here. <laughs> so he threw me out, really. Wise man. Yeah. Uh, I then I went on up to New Hampshire and stayed with some friends. And uh, it was while I was there that I was arrested. Now, I think that the reason that I didn't get as much press coverage nationwide as I might have otherwise is that all this was happening at the time that President McKinley was assassinated. In fact, the day I was arrested, 
was the very day that Leon Childress, the assassin, was uh, executed. So that was uh, one of the explanations. I guess that uh, I didn't it was you that I would have been really, really famous, and I'm not. <laughs> um, Elmer Sedgwick, a writer long, uh, years past, said that I was a champion of American mur murder without equal. Pretty nice compliment. <laughs> um, during the trial, at first they were looking for when they oh they exhumed those bodies. And one, one murder that they thought they could prove was that of uh, Genevieve uh, Davis Gordon. She uh, he they excuse me. They were uh, trying to find evidence of arsenic. Because when you think of poison, you think arsenic. Well, I didn't use arsenic. <laughs> so they, they did find arsenic in the body, but it was arsenic that was used when the body was involved. And uh, that was proved. So finally, finally, they found that uh, the bodies were full of morphine. Now, when they were doing all this, uh, when they were prosecuting me, they had alienists interview. That's what they call psychologists in those days. And I tried to be as honest as I could with them. I also kind of was thinking that if they were if these aliens said that I was insane, that maybe instead of getting a death penalty, that I might be sent to an insane asylum and then I would be cured and they would release me. Well, I'll tell you, that never happened because they never let me out. They sent me to the time insane asylum and I stayed there the rest of my long life. I lived to be 81 and I died in 1938. So I was in the Tottenham asylum for a very, very long time. Um, the, I had hoped, really, that I had thought I would be released from the state of heaven, but I just adjusted to the situation and just put up with it. As I can, but one thing that I didn't like at all was that they kept trying to poison me. <laughs> um, I would like to be able to ask you, all of you, if you have any questions or observations, or maybe some of you know something about this story that we'd like to, to share. I've heard that um, you curled up in bed with uh, people before they um, were taken down completely. And were you getting your jollies off? <laughs> well, you know, I. Yes. <laughs> I thought it might be too gruesome a detail to mention in this nice company. <laughs> Promise. 
state who were investigating. I think that they have been become suspicious. <coughs> but yes, yes, there were. I, and I don't know all their names. Don't know. You know, I don't remember everything because after all, I am over 150 years old. <laughs> Well, I don't know exactly how many were related here, but um, her Minnie's husband was Captain Irving Gibbs, and his father was Paul. So, yes, so did the address mystery lane uh, exist before you moved here, or did it stay after the <laughs> uh, Yeah, actually, when we when we first moved. It was Washington Street, and then uh, a year or two later, they changed the name of the street in honor of me. <laughs> yeah, how much time elapsed between uh, the autopsy or the death and then the autopsy? Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to give you an estimate. Uh, probably, um, probably a month or six weeks, I guess. I'm, so, 19 Mystery Lane is actually where Jolly Jane, aka Shad, lives. And my question is, um, do you ever get a sense or a presence that Jane's around? <laughs> I guess I'll go back to being a sheriff now. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, no. Um, the, but my kids, when they were little, oh my gosh. The, uh, now those, all these windows are, are the original ones. You know? So when the wind blows, you hear the wind rolls, windows rattle, etc. And my kids were absolutely convinced that Jane was there. <laughs> She, yes, she did. Yes, she did. She was, uh, I, she died now. And I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm sure. I read one account that said that Jane and that uh, Margaret had an older sister who had been committed to an insane asylum. But the one that went into the orphanage with me, I know that she died young. George? Oh, that was great. I've never heard such broad detail. But I think one, the doctor involved with Lenny Rose, uh, Leonard Wood, who was um, involved with the Philippines, who was a general and a MD, I think. Right, he was at San Juan Hill. Uh, I, there's one thing I'd like to add, and it's, it's probably the only plus side of this ledger. When Ellery Sedgwick, I have had this book, uh, when Ellery Sedgwick was a freshman sophomore at Harvard, he got uh, pneumonia. And his nurse was Jan Top. And I'll have to show you this passage. And, she, and at that time in his life, he was very appreciative of Jan Top because she nursed him literally back to life and he finished his career um, he had left him on etc. So it was only later on he, he reviewed uh, his notes in that case. Probably uh, not only later on but older people because uh, Jane said older people should not live so long. <laughs> and then it was a lot of us and yeah uh, you know, there were many, many people that she nursed, that she was very, did very well. She took very good care of probably by far most of her patients. She took very good care of Yes. Myra Connors. Myra Connors. <laughs> when I was tried for the murder, um, I, in my confession, I delineated and identified 
31 people that I can remember. <laughs> and remember the details. But now, you know, if I can remember 31, you know that there were some that I had forgotten. <laughs> so, and some people thought that I might have murdered as many as 100 people all over the same time, which is almost impossible to tell because a lot of people, you know, in those days, if old people died, that was natural. So, I could kill somebody and it just wouldn't look like anything special to him. So, um, yes, I can hear you. Uh, oh, I forgot, I forgot to tell about that. I got the morphine and atropine in the pharmacies in Falmouth and where they, uh, the authorities checked out on uh, me and they knew I bought no arsenic, but that I had bought purchased atropine and morphine at both of those pharmacies and quite a bit of it. <laughs>
at some point. Yeah. Did you ever get in contact with Lizzie Borden or correspond with her? <laughs> oh no, I didn't like Lizzie Borden. <laughs> Did she know about you? Well, she kind of. I got she, she was, you know, she was acquitted. She killed two parents with an axe, and then she was acquitted. Oh my. Good lawyer. Good lawyer, he said. Anybody else? Did I skip anything, David? My husband did. Okay. Thank you, Sherry.